Welcome to The Backstory with Dr. Ricky Singh. This podcast is focused on bringing you the latest research-based information about dramatically improving health, well-being, and quality of life. And here's your host, Dr. Ricky Singh. Hey everyone, welcome to The Backstory Beat, where I take the latest in medical literature and translate the science into something accessible to you, the listeners. But before we get on to our main topic, I want to let you know that this podcast is a production of the Podcast Authority. If you're interested in starting a successful podcast of your own or for your business, reach out to my friends Scott and Jason at the Podcast Authority by going to thepodcastauthority.com. Back to the backstory beat. So today we're going to talk about intermittent fasting. I've spoken previously during one of my episodes on intermittent fasting, as it is currently one of the world's most popular health and fitness trends. People are using it to lose weight, to improve their health, and really to simplify their lifestyles. But what is intermittent fasting? Intermittent fasting, also abbreviated IF, is an eating pattern that cycles between periods of fasting and eating. And it doesn't really specify which foods you should eat, but rather when you should eat them. And in this respect, it's not really a diet in the conventional sense, but more accurately, it's described as an eating pattern. Common intermittent fasting methods involve daily 16-hour fasts or fasting for 24 hours a day, maybe two, two times a week. And there are several methods of doing intermittent fasting, all of which involve splitting the day or the week into periods of eating and periods of fasting. Now, some of the more popular methods include the 16-8 method, also known as the lean gains protocol. Basically, it involves skipping breakfast and restricting your daily eating period to eight hours, usually one to 9 p.m., something like that, and then fasting for 16 hours. For the purpose, by reducing your calorie intake, all of these methods should cause weight loss as long as you don't compensate by eating too much during the eating period. So the article I'm discussing today is a randomized control trial that was published in JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association. It was published last month in August of 2022. And the authors are Dr. Humaira Jamshed and her colleagues based out of the Department of Nutrition Sciences at the University of Alabama in Birmingham. Basically, what they were looking for was how effective intermittent fasting was for losing weight and body fat. And they were questioning whether or not the timing of the eating window affected these outcomes. So they tried to determine whether practicing time-restricted eating by eating earlier in the day is more effective for weight loss, fat loss, and cardiometabolic health than eating over a 12 or more hour period. This study was a 14-week parallel arm randomized control trial and all the patients received a weight loss treatment program and they were randomized either to eating early time restricted which meant they're eating from about 7 a.m to 3 p.m over an eight hour window or controlled eating which meant they could eat over a 12 hour window in addition to be randomized to one of these treatment groups they all received weight loss counseling which involved energy restriction at the University of Alabama Birmingham Weight Loss Medical Clinic. And basically what they received was one-on-one -on -one counseling from a registered dietitian at baseline, which was about 60 minutes long, and then periodically throughout the trial for 30-minute sessions. And patients were instructed to follow a hypocaloric diet which was 500 kilocalories below their resting energy expenditure, and also try to exercise 75 to 150 minutes per week, depending on their baseline physical activity. The primary outcomes were weight loss and fat loss, and secondary outcomes included blood pressure, heart rate, glucose levels, insulin levels, and some plasma lipid levels like cholesterol numbers. So what were the results? So they ended up screening 656 patients, and enrolled only 90 participants due to the strict inclusion and exclusion criteria. The participants had a mean body mass index of 39.6. So in the obese and severe obese groups with a mean age of 43, so a relatively younger patient population. And during the intervention, the early time-restricted group ate within a mean period of about 7.6 hours, 
while the control group ate over a period of about 12.3 hours. So there's a difference of about 4.8 hours of eating time between the two groups. They both ate breakfast around the same time, but the time-restricted group finished eating at about 3 or 3.30, and the control group finished eating about 8 or 8.30 p.m. And what the results showed was that actually in both groups, there was weight loss. In the control group, they lost four kilograms, and in the time-restricted group, they lost 6.3 kilograms, so they both achieved clinically meaningful weight loss. But the additional 2.3 kilograms of body weight lost in the time-restricted group was shown to be statistically significant. What's interesting, however, is that they did not find any difference in fat loss, which is something I'm gonna talk about in a moment. In addition to weight loss, the early time-restricted group also showed lower blood pressure by an additional four millimeters of mercury, but really no changes in the secondary outcomes, insulin levels, glucose levels, and other cholesterol metrics. So what the authors concluded was that early time-restricted eating is feasible, it's doable. The patients adhered to the protocol. They did about six days per week on average. And despite the challenges of navigating evening social activities and work schedules, adherence to the time-restricted group was similar to other interventions, even in the control group. And the key to this study was that early time-restricted eating was more effective for losing weight than eating over a period of time of 12 hours or more. So what happens when you fast? Certainly we've talked about the fat loss and the weight loss, but several things also happen on the molecular or the cellular level. For example, your body adjusts hormone levels to make sure that stored body fat is more accessible. And your cells also initiate important repair mechanisms and they change some of the expression of genes in your body. And some of the changes occur. Number one is human growth hormone. When you fast, the levels of human growth hormone skyrocket, sometimes as much as five-fold. And with elevated levels of human growth hormone, this has benefits for fat loss and for muscle gain, just to name a few things. The most important thing is insulin sensitivity. So when you fast, your body's insulin sensitivity improves and the levels of your insulin drop dramatically. What happens then is that your stored body fat is more accessible to use for energy. So whether it's weight loss, fat loss, changes in your hormone level or cell function, there are tremendous benefits of intermittent fasting. With this data from the new study, there are even further benefits from early time-restricted intermittent fasting, trying to finish off eating before 3 p.m. versus the old model of skipping breakfast and eating later on into the day. Certainly, future trials will need to enroll larger sample sizes. This study only enrolled 90 participants but a larger group could help determine if body composition and fat loss could be changed by intermittent fasting, if the other cardiometabolic profile can improve with intermittent fasting, and also further studies could investigate whether the timing and the duration of the eating window could affect these windows. Well, thank you for tuning in to the Backstory Beat, where we shed some light on intermittent fasting. Stay tuned next month, where I bring you the latest in medical research and innovations. Until then, we've got your back. Take care. Thanks for listening to The Backstory. Please subscribe, rate the podcast, and review The Backstory on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Play Music. And feel free to share this podcast on social media or even your own website or blog. This podcast is for general information purposes only. It does not constitute the practice of medicine, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information is at the user's own risk. The content of this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for medical advice. To learn more about Dr. Singh and his clinical research, please follow him on social media. You can also sign up for his newsletter by going to www.rickysinghmd.com. That's R-I-C-K-Y-S-I-N-G-H-M-D dot com.